this is a Sunday night, uh, April the 12th, Bible study for Lone Star Baptist Church. Uh, I apologize for being a little late getting it up uh, tonight with the weather coming through. Uh, we uh, felt like it would be best just to wait a little while and, as we watch to make sure that uh, that people are okay. And uh, I'm thankful that those that we've heard from, from the church, that everyone's okay. I know there's many that uh, have endured damage, trouble this afternoon, maybe even uh, uh, injuries. I don't know that, but there may be. I know whatever loss they, they face that they're dealing with, they need our prayers. And so as we begin tonight, before I read the scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this good day, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that we have something to celebrate. Thankful that He is alive. Heavenly Father, we enjoy the good service we're able to have this morning. Thankful that we were able to get together, even in a modified way, uh, to be able to worship together. And I pray now that uh, you take the message tonight, the study. I pray that you could use it. I know that you're able to. I pray that I could yield myself unto you. Be humble and just uh, say that you'd have for me to say and nothing else. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that have been affected by the weather today. I know there's been uh, widespread uh, weather problems, but possibly damage. And, uh, I know maybe there'll be more to come. And uh, I pray that as you could uh, see fit, that you could spare. And, and then those who are affected, that you could give grace and strength and help uh, to them. I pray that we'd always have hearts of compassion for those that are in trouble. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read just a few verses of Scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. Uh, I made the statement here a few weeks ago that as we get toward the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, that I'll not try to uh, go through every verse. Uh, but I want to look at a, a few verses that I feel like would be good for us to look at. Of course, last Sunday night we looked at verse 1 of chapter 10. It said, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is a reputation for wisdom and honor. We looked at some little things the Bible talks about that can uh, cause us to uh, lose our reputation, that can cause us, uh, as the dead flies do, to spoil something that's very valuable and mean a lot to us and uh, even would take a long time to build. And we certainly need to be careful uh, that we guard those things in our lives. But I want to go down to verse 16. I want to read three verses tonight, verses 16, 17, and 18, and just try to get forth a thought uh, that is on my heart. So let's read those uh, together, and uh, then we'll go back and look at some uh, thoughts dealing with it. Verse 16, he said, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of hands the house droppeth through. I'm going to deal with those three verses, as I said. I'm going to go back to verse 16 and make some statements about verse 16. Really, the, they all build to verse 18. I believe that's the key verse in the passage that I read to you. But let's go back and, and look at how he builds up here. In verse 16, he said, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Now, I know that our system of government here, I wouldn't have to explain it to you, that we don't have a monarchy. We have a, a, a democratic republic where the people elect leaders, and even the leader of our country, our, of course, is the president here. Some countries have prime ministers, and there are different forms of government around the world. Uh, but the way that our founding fathers set up our government is that uh, the people, through the Electoral College, would elect a, an individual to be our president. And there's some requirements that are upon a, a man to, to be president. And uh, one of those is that there's an age requirement that he must be 35 years old. And so that we don't have to worry necessarily about a child uh, being uh, the president or the leader of this nation. Uh, yet the, it, the, the form of government that the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel had in the Bible days was a monarchy. And of course that, that just means that it passed from one generation to the next. It was by family. And so there were times when the king would be a child. There were times when the king who was reigning at that time, that uh, he would die. And maybe he'd die in battle, he'd die from disease, whatever the case might be. There were those that the Lord would even take out because of their wickedness. And that it just turned out to where maybe that king was young and his son would be young. And so you had a young, really a child that came to the throne and and we think about a child king, most of the time we think about Josiah. I believe he was eight years old when he began to reign. Uh, Manasseh, 
he was king, I believe, 55 years in Judah. And uh, he was uh, 12 years old, if my memory serves me correctly, when he became king. But neither one of those were the youngest. The youngest, I believe, was Joash, if, if I'm correct on that. The Bible says that he was seven years old uh, when he began to reign. And uh, so the scripture says here that, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. And certainly we know there would be some reasons for this, that you think about a country with a, with a king that would be just a child, they would be in a very uh, precarious situation uh, to have such a young king uh, because of the fact that uh, obviously they don't, they don't have wisdom, they don't have knowledge that uh, maybe an older king would have. Uh, and yet that they have, you know, the leader of a nation has great influence upon a nation. You can say what you want to, uh, whether you, you like the president at the time, or you don't like the president at the time, but he has great influence upon, uh, the, upon the, the country and upon the people uh, of the country. You see that on, on display of the nation of Israel and Judah, that the king, the way that he led, a lot of times the people would follow. And that's certainly a uh, natural response. But he says, What are thee, O land, when thy king is a child? And not so much, I believe, that he's talking about uh, in age. But I believe he's talking about here in a level of maturity. And uh, no matter whether the king's 7 or 8 or 12 or 35 or 65, 75, that if he's still a child in his maturity, if he's still a child uh, in his spiritual walk, if he's immature, uh, then uh, I would certainly agree that the land's going to have trouble. And certainly there would be woes that would be upon the land uh, when the king would be a child. You think about childhood, that childhood's a carefree time, it should be. I know that uh, there's children that get thrust into positions of, of uh, situations maybe where parents are, where parents would die or parents just not do their job and the kids would be forced to have to step up and do what a parent usually does. Uh, you, you saw that probably more in the past than you do today. Uh, maybe time when times were, were harder, and maybe depression years and things like that. You hear people talk about those sorts of situations. But, uh, you know, the, the last thing a child ought to have to worry about is to rule a country. And uh, it would hard, be hard for a child to understand the complexity of, of, of situations. And so that uh, he said, Woe to the land when the king is a child. And he went on and made the statement, he said, And thy princes eat in the morning. In other words, woe to the land, not only if the, the king's a child, and again, more so a child in maturity and understanding than a child by age, but he talked about the princes of the land. The princes would be those who would be in the positions, maybe we'd say cabinet positions in the land. It said that they would eat in the morning. Now, we all eat in the morning. That's one of the first things I do when I get up. I've always done that. I'll eat in the morning. I used to go to the, the breakfast table first thing. And that's not what he's speaking of here necessarily, just to eat in the morning. I've, I've heard it's good to eat in the morning. Uh, I've always just, I like to eat, so I like to eat in the morning. But he's talking about here a, a luxurious type of lifestyle. Uh, he, he's talking about, in, in this case, that instead of tending to the business that needed to be tended to of the day, that, uh, that they would indulge themselves in luxuries and dainties and feastings and, and uh, put off the things that they, they need to do. You know, the morning's a wonderful time. The morning's a time when you're fresh, you can get a lot done. I always enjoy it. You know, the opportunities I get to study and just to, to meditate and, and to read and pray in, in the morning time. But he said, when your king's a child and your princes don't do what they're supposed to do, but they uh, partake of luxuries and those things in, in the morning rather than uh, the business that needs to be attended to. He said, whoa, under the land. And then he flips that around in verse 17. You see the flip side of this. He said, blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And so he said the other side of that, the, a land is blessed when the king is a son of nobles. Not just in blood, not just that he's from a noble line, but he's from a, he's from a line that he has learned from those who uh, take their position seriously. Those who, it says that they don't eat uh, for drunkenness, they don't feast for drunkenness, but they eat in due season. They do things at the proper time. And they do things for the proper reason, not for drunkenness, but for strength. In other words, that what they do, they do uh, for the good of the people and not for their own good. And so you've got two different situations here. 
And then he sums it up in verse 18. I'll deal with that for just a, just a few minutes. He said, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. Now I know we've all been maybe driving down the road and you see a house that uh, was once uh, lived in and uh, a house that at one time that uh, you know it was kept up and uh, uh, had a it was a, li a, a lively house and uh, that uh, had a family there and it just seemed like a happy house and then you maybe the the owners of the house grow old and that they pass from this life and nobody moves in it it's almost like the house dies isn't it but you can just see it go down I can think of a house in particular that I go by from time to time. Uh, it hadn't been that long ago that uh, the man and the wife both were alive, and, and that uh, it was a house that uh, was a you know wasn't a fancy house, but an older house, and it was kept up well. And you go by there today, and the paint's peeling, and shingles are blown off, and, and you can just tell that it's it's it, it's falling apart very quickly. And so he said, by much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. What he's talking about here is that when we fail to do the little things, we talked about the little things last week, but when, when the little things fail to get done, it's amazing how many little things we do every day. Let's just think about our physical house for just a minute. Every day that you do maintenance on your house, every day that you tend to it, and when you do that every day, uh, when, when things aren't left undone, then that keeps it in good order. But when little things are left undone, then that leads to bigger problems. And so that certainly that Solomon was not just referring to a physical house here, but he's referring to any sort of uh, organization, any sort of structure, whether it be a nation, whether it be a family, whether it be a business, uh, whether it be a church. And according to this passage, I believe what he's getting across here, as you go back and think about the king, what did he say? Woe to the nation when the king's a child. Woe to the nation when the king is not doing what he needs to do. When he's not leading in the proper way. When he's allowing his princes, when he's allowing those under him to uh, neglect the tasks that are set uh, before them. Uh, he said that that land is in trouble. Uh, but he said in verse 17, the king who's the son of nobles, the king who leads well, who makes sure that his princes are uh, doing what's best for the people, that they're eating for strength and not for drunkenness, he said that nation will prosper and that nation uh, will be uh, blessed. So what I want us to see tonight for just a minute is this, that whether it's in a family, in a business, in a church, that the leader, he sets the agenda, doesn't he? The leader is the one who sets the tone and really... For us, what I want to deal with for just a minute, let's think about the family for just a minute. That in the family, it's the father. It's the father. That if the father's focused on worldly things, if the father's focused on temporal things, if he's uh, putting his effort into growing a bank account, or he's putting his effort into the accumulation of physical wealth or physical goods or hobbies or whatever you might... Uh, whatever you want to think about there, that the building is going to decay, isn't it? The house is going to decay. In a business, that if the, uh, if the owner, if the CEO, if the manager, if they're putting their interest ahead of the interest of the business, if they're not doing what's best for the business, the business is going to go down. In a nation, if you don't have a servant at the head of a nation to guide the nation in the right way, he said that through slowfulness, by much slowfulness, the building is going to decay. What happens if that's not dealt with? He said, finally, the house is going to drop through. I mentioned the old house a while ago. And, uh, if the old house gets, uh, it gets left alone long enough, the old roof start to leak, the rafters begin to rot. Before long, you'll see it it'll collapse. The roof will fall in. And once the roof falls in, you just want to tear it down. There's really no hope for it uh, anymore. It's too far gone. Why? Because that through slowfulness it decayed, and then when nothing was done, the house fell through. So as as fathers, as as a pastor, as 
whoever you would be, a position of leadership, when we notice decay, that ought to be a surefire sign that we're being slowful in what we are doing. If we see decay in our home, I'm not talking about the physical structure, I'm talking about uh, the, the spiritual structure in our, in our family. If we see decay in the spiritual things, that we need to take heed to that, and we need to repent, we need to turn, and we need to repair that as much as possible, because if we fail to do that, he said eventually the house is going to collapse. It's going to fall through. It's going to get be too far gone. We're going to lose that that's valuable to us. In the church, the pastor needs to be a good leader, that he needs to set the tone, uh, that he needs to uh, guide the church. He needs to look out over the flock to dangers and things that would be coming in. He needs to warn them and those repairs that need to be made when the, when the building starts to decay, that those things need to be made. And all that is is just evidence of, of, of a problem with the heart of the people. In, in the home and in the family, when you see the family beginning to decay, there's already long-rooted and deep problems that are there. And so therefore, daily, that we need to make sure as the leader of our family, as the leader of our home, that we're doing what's necessary to maintain our family, to maintain our family spiritually, to maintain our family in the things of the Lord. I want to read a verse of Scripture to you in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, and then we'll try to come to a close. The book of Hebrews chapter 2, he said this in verse 1. I, just, I thought about this verse of Scripture. I know it's digging with maybe a, just a, a little different thought here, but I believe we can get something out of it. He said in verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Today, what are you letting slip? What is it that's in disrepair? What are you letting go? What are you putting a focus on that's hindering you from the better things, the best things? Uh, you know, I, sometimes when you go in the store, you'll see... Uh, a product. I, I, I've noticed this. I'll just use this for example. Floor mats in, in a vehicle. That there'll be several uh, different variations there that you can get. And I noticed this that maybe one brand it'll say good, better, and best. And in our homes, are we choosing the good or the better? Or are we choosing the best? When we choose the best, the building doesn't decay and the house doesn't fall through. But when we choose that, maybe that's just good or better, and we put something else in the top priority, the decay begins to take place. The house begins to decay. And if that's not dealt with before long, it'll fall through. So I would encourage you to, to this afternoon or tonight that whatever position of leadership that you have in your life, that you take responsibility for the daily maintenance you take responsibility for that that's been entrusted to you. And you don't be like the slothful. The Bible says that, uh, the, well, Proverbs wrote this back in the book, uh, Solomon wrote it in the book of Proverbs, that he went by the field of the slothful. And it talked about how the wall had been, it was growing up with nettles and it was, it was beginning to fall through. Why? Not because of any, anything that had been done, not things that had been done wrong, but it was just neglect. And so, uh, tonight, let's remember the statement, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A little bit of sleep, a little bit of slumber, a little bit of, of just uh, neglect. Before long, things will fall through. Let's not be like the king who was a child, who didn't rule his kingdom as he ought to have ruled it. And it had a great effect upon the nation. But let's be the one that was the son of the noble. And he made sure that his princes, he made sure those under him, that they did what was right. Because ultimately, it wasn't them that had to answer for it. It was him that had to answer for it. And let's not let the house drop through. Heavenly Father, take the words tonight. Use it for your honor and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.